we also will have uh, continued discussions of this topic within the Slack discussion channel. Uh, so we'll be uh, keeping track of that and uh, moderating that as well. If, after the session is over, we can continue some of these chats and discussions in that Slack channel. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker who is delivering their presentation uh, by video. So Feng Yang from Georgia State University is going to be talking about the biomechanical mechanisms of Tai Chi, Jate, tai Chi Gate for preventing falls. Hello, everyone. My name is Feng Yang, and I'm from Georgia State University. My presentation is about biomechanic mechanisms of Tai Chi gate for preventing falls. The co-author of this work is Wei Liu. As we all know, falls are a serious challenge among old adults. Tai Chi has been increasingly used as an intervention to prevent falls. Tai Chi is a traditional Chinese exercise it has tens of forms. In all previous Tai Chi related fall prevention studies, certain number of Tai Chi forms were selected. However, the rationale of selecting those Tai Chi forms is unclear. So this may negatively affect the development. So hold on. So, so Brian, uh, I, tried to send, I tried to send you a message on, Slack, on uh, the Zoom chat, but you're oh, kind of you blocking the exam. video. Oh, can we can restart this video. Yeah, and then if we can just, um, I will monitor the, for the participants and can let them in as we play videos. Great, okay. So sorry about that. We will restart this and make sure that we can see the talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Feng Yang, and I'm from Georgia State University. My presentation is about biomechanic mechanisms of Tai Chi gate for preventing falls. The co-author of this work is Wei Liu. As we all know, falls are a serious challenge among old adults. Tai Chi has been increasingly used as an intervention to prevent falls. Tai Chi is a traditional Chinese exercise. It has tens of forms. In all previous Tai Chi related fall prevention studies, certain number of Tai Chi forms were selected. However, the rationale of selecting those Tai Chi forms is unclear. So this may negatively affect the development of efficient Tai Chi based fall prevention programs. It's important to examine the biomechanics of all Tai Chi forms in order to identify the optimal ones. Tai Chi gait is one of the most common Tai Chi movements. This animation is the second form of 24 form Yang style Tai Chi. The leg movements is a typical Tai Chi gait. This picture shows us the movement sequence of Tai Chi gait. The objective of this study was to examine dynamic gait stability and leg joint moments during Tai Chi gait. Dynamic gait stability is related to balance. Leg joint moments are relevant to limb support. If we can improve these two factors, then the risk of force should be reduced. We recruited 10 experienced Tai Chi players. They performed both regular and Tai Chi walking. Their body kinematics and ground reaction forces were collected by a motion capture system and two synchronized force plates. Dynamic gait stability was calculated from the kinematic data and two characteristic gait events, touchdown and lift off. In this study, dynamic gait stability was quantified by the relative movement of the body's central mass with the, the base of support. Leg joint moments were calculated using inverse dynamics. The peak magnitude of the joint was determined 
for each leg joint in all three planes. Dynamic stability and joint moments were compared between the two sets of gait by using PIDT tests. Let's take a look at the comparison of dynamic gait stability between Tai Chi gait and regular gait. The red bar is for the regular gait, the open bar is for the Tai Chi gait. Please note that the higher the stability value, the more dynamically stable one is. It's apparent that the Tai Chi gait is less stable than the regular gait. As for the joint moments, the results indicate that Tai Chi gait is associated with increased joint moment at ankle joint in the transverse plane, at knee joint in all three planes, and in the hip joint in the front plane. In conclusion, Tai Chi gait challenges dynamic gait stability and it demands high joint moment in comparison to regular gait. Such stimulations may lead to neuromuscular adaptations which can be beneficial to prevent falls. In this study, we just uh, focus on one Tai Chi form within a small sample size. However, the approach can be applied to all other Tai Chi forms in order for us to identify the best uh, forms which can maximize the effects of any Tai Chi based uh, fall prevention programs. Thank you for your attention to our work. Now I would like to take any questions you may have. Okay, we're gonna move right into our second speaker here. Uh, so our second speaker is Sarah Hemmler from the University of Pittsburgh. All right, um, thank you guys. Um, yes, my name is Sarah Hemmler and along with my collaborators today, Vonnie Sundaram and Kurt Bishorner, I'll be presenting a hydrodynamic model to predict undershoe fluid pressures based on the dimensions of a worn region. So before I go any further, if you have shoes around you, um, go ahead and look at the bottom. The goal of, the sh of my talk today is to maybe get you to have a different perspective on shoe tread. So we know that falls and fall-related injuries are a major issue with 40 to 62% of fall-related injuries being attributed to slipping. And these slips often occur with reduced friction, commonly over contaminated surfaces. Tread on the bottom of shoes is a very important factor for reducing the risk of slips. So when you have a tread channel, as shown on the picture on the right, and it comes in contact with the contaminated flooring, the fluid can be dispersed through these tread channels and it therefore decreases undershoe fluid pressures and decreases the risk of slipping. However, if you have warm shoes, perhaps as shown on the picture on the right, there's nowhere for these fluids to be dispersed. So you have decreased undershoe fluid dispersion, increased undershoe fluid pressures, if you think of something like hydroplaning, and therefore you have increased risk of slipping. So the purpose of this talk is to assess whether or not we can use shoe wear geometry to predict undershoe fluid pressures to reduce slip risk. And to do this, I'm gonna present a hydrodynamic theory that simulates a shoe sliding across a contaminated surface. And I'm going to use the term predicted film thickness, which is H naught in this case. And um, this particular equation was first used by Fuller in 1956 um, but I'm gonna apply it to shoe wear as a novel method. And um, on the left, I have some of the variables that are included um, with the most important one that I'm gonna be focusing on as the length and the width of the continuous region on the posterior of the heel that doesn't have tread. And I'll call that the size of the worn region. And what we're measuring is how much fluid is there between the bearing and which is represented by the shoe and a contaminated flooring to know pretty much how much um, hydroplaning is gonna happen as someone is slipping. And so I'm gonna use three different experiments or data from three different experiments to um, look at this relationship. In the first experiment, there were four shoes that were mechanically abraded at three different angles to simulate heel strike to flat foot. And they were abraded at 20 seconds each for um, these angles. And that was one wear cycle. 
After each wear cycle, we measured the undershoe fluid pressures by sliding the shoes mechanically across a contaminated surface that had four embedded fluid pressure sensors. For experiment two, we had 13 participants who wore 22 pairs of shoes total. So each of the participants had two pairs of shoes and some were excluded. And they wore each pair of shoes for one month during alternating months. And after each month of wear in their workplace, we measured the undershoe fluid pressures in the same way as experiment one. In experiment three, we had 57 participants who wore their own shoes in a cross-sectional natural wear procedure and they experienced an unexpected slip trial. And during this slip trial, um, they, the liquid was over an array of five by six, um, so 30 fluid pressure sensors, and we can measure the undershoe fluid pressures um, naturally. In addition to measuring the undershoe fluid pressures, we also measured the size of the worn region. And this was after each wear cycle in experiment one, after each month in experiment two, and after data collection in experiment three. So for the statistics and results, we had um, a repeated measures ANOVA was used for experiment one and two with shoe and participant as the random effect variables and a bivariate correlation for experiment three. For all three of the experiments, the predicted film thickness, which was based on the size of the worn region, was the independent variable um, for all three. And then the dependent variable was the peak fluid pressure. And so on the plot here, we have peak fluid pressure on the y-axis and the predicted film thickness on the x-axis with each of the experiments in a different color and shape marker. And as you can see, as the predicted film thickness increased across all experiments, um, we also saw that the peak fluid pressure also increased. And so from this, we can see that the predicted film thickness can be used to predict undershoe fluid pressures um, for shoe wear. And from this, since the predicted film thickness is based on the size of the worn region on the bottom of the shoe, this can be a good indicator for undershoe hydrodynamics. And the next step will be to develop a measurement tool for assessing the worn region of shoes and so that we can supply replacement recommendations and reduce the risk of slipping. So now look at the bottom of your shoes again, um, and you can see if there's a size of the worn region and assess um, your slip risk. So I'd like to thank our funding sources, everyone who is involved, and here's my contact info. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we are gonna move right into the next talk, continuing on the slipping theme here. Uh, Corbin Rasmussen will be presenting his, uh, his talk here. And again, we'll hold questions until the Q&A period. Please post questions into the chat box in Zoom and the moderators will pose those in the Q&A portion coming up. All right, Corbin, you, um, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm excited to share some results from uh, slipping foot and recovery step yaw um, after a turning slip. Ooh. Okay. Uh, so various strategies for maintaining or regaining balance and stability have been described. During standing, the classic ankle and hip strategies allow us to counter small disturbances while stepping is employed for larger ones. For walking, swinging the arms, or taking a compensatory step are key to preventing a fall after a trip or slip. Another mechanism that was recently examined is foot yaw. From past work, we know that foot yaw acts as a steering mechanism during turns and is coupled to lateral step placement to counter small fluctuations during walking. However, it is still unclear whether foot yaw plays a role in recovering from larger disturbances such as slips. So as a first step to filling this gap, our aim was to determine how both slipping foot and recovery step yaw change under various slip contexts and severities. We performed a secondary analysis of previously collected data from slips on turns to achieve the same. Our slips were delivered with this device called the wearable apparatus for slip perturbations or WASP. In short, WASP is a remote controlled banana peel allowing the wearer to walk until activated, which then exposes the wearer to a low friction surface, as you can see here. This device allows the perturbed foot to rotate freely during the slip. So the slip context that we examined were the turn radius and the perturbed foot relative to the turn. Subjects walked along a curvilinear path of either one or two meters in radius. Slips were delivered to the inside or outside foot during early, mid, or late stance phase, although we only used the early stance trials here. 
So slip onset, cessation, and gait events were determined from kinematics. Foot segments were simplified to a line connecting the calcaneus and second metatarsal markers. Slipping foot yaw was calculated as the peak rotation attained by the foot during the slip from its position at slip onset. For recovery step yaw, the angle between the stepping foot and the center of mass velocity vector at step touchdown was derived, and the average unperturbed step yaw under the same context was subtracted from each to get the recovery step yaw change. Finally, slip distance was our analog for slip severity and was the displacement of the slipping foot's center of mass position from slip onset to cessation. We use linear, linear mixed effects models to assess the effect of slip context on slipping and recovery step yaw and Spearman rank correlation coefficients to characterize the relationship that each have with slip distance. So in this figure, the horizontal axis represents turn radius, the vertical represents max slipping foot yaw, and the color coding represents the perturbed foot. Positive values will always denote external rotation, while negative values denote internal rotation. Inside foot slips attained greater external rotation than outside foot slips, and a significant main effect of turn radius and interaction between the two contexts indicates that wider turns reduce the max external rotation attained during inside foot slips, but increase it during outside foot slips. From this, we can conclude that in general, slipping feet externally rotate, and that turn curvature has a side-specific influence on slipping foot yaw. So for this figure, the horizontal axis depicts slip distance, the vertical depicts uh, max slipping foot yaw, and the color still depicts the perturbed foot. Significant, moderate, positive correlations were found for both inside and outside slips with slip distance, showing that regardless of foot, external rotation tends to increase along with slip severity. So moving to recovery steps. Um, in this figure, uh, it's similar to the previous box plot but the vertical axis represents the change in recovery step yaw from unperturbed steps. From this data, it is clear that outside foot recovery steps are internally rotated compared to normal steps, while inside foot recovery steps are externally rotated. In addition, wider turns reduce the degree of recovery step yaw. From these results, we deduce that the direction of recovery step yaw is side specific and orients the foot toward the direction of the turn and that additional rotation is reduced on wider turns. Again, this figure is very similar to the previous scatter plot. However, the vertical represents recovery step yaw change from unperturbed steps. A significant, strong, positive correlation was found between recovery step yaw change and slip distance for inside foot recovery steps, illustrating that the amount of external rotation at step touchdown increases with slip severity. The correlation for outside foot recovery steps was moderate yet insignificant. Uh, but this figure suggests that internal rotation may increase along with severity, but we need more broadly distributed data to assess this. Uh, nevertheless, we can conclude that greater slip severity leads to increased recovery step yaw, at least for inside foot steps, but at most for both in a site-specific fashion. So in conclusion, our preliminary results support the notion of recovery step yaw as a balanced recovery strategy after slipping. This may act to extend the base of support with a shorter step, and or enable the ankle dorsiflexors and plantar flexors to assist in lateral balance. The potential function of slipping foot yaw is less clear from our results, particularly whether it is beneficial or detrimental to slip recovery. Further research that uses a modeling approach may be particularly useful to determine the exact functions of both recovery step and slipping foot yaw. Future work should also assess foot yaw in populations at greater risk of falling and whether task specific fall prevention training alters the control of both slipping and recovery step yaw. So finally, I want to thank ASB for the opportunity to share this work, uh, my research team at UNO, especially those listed on the slide, and the NIH and UCRCA for their support of this work. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Corbin. Uh, we're going to move right into the next talk. Again, if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat at any time. The, moder the moderators will be moder monitoring the chat window. Um, and pose those questions to our speakers during the Q&A portion. Our next speaker is Kira Tui from the University of Dayton. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for coming today. I'll be talking about the impact of an ankle foot orthosis on reactive stepping in young adults. So for this one, um, we do know that the main focus of an AFO is for movement and gait, um, but it's also been shown to improve standing balance as well. However, this doesn't extend to dynamic standing balance, um, which is a cause for concern. And we've also seen in studies um, a high rate of falls in AFO users. 
So one study found 40% attributed a fall in the first 12 months following a stroke to their AFO. However, we haven't really studied AFOs and reactive stepping. Um, there's been one pilot study published this year using a treadmill perturbation. So goal, the goal of this work was to use a lean and release paradigm to generate our perturbation um, in order to be able to characterize the AFO influence on stepping limb, as well as looking for a kinematic chain of adjustments. So following the hip, knee, and ankle joints throughout the reactive steps. So we tested a total of 20 people, average age of 23 and a little over a half years, um, and they were fitted with a standard um, semi-rigid plastic posterior strut AFO. So you can see that in the picture on the left on the leg closest to the camera. And they wore 25 retroreflective markers as well as four marker plates during the study. And you can see a little bit of the setup of lean and release system. We completed 30 total trials with them. So 10 trials with no AFO present and then 20 trials with an AFO. So 10 on each limb. And all of these were tested using a Vicon motion capture system, as well as two Burtek and ground force plates. We did all of the analysis in visual 3D. So this was used to create events and then to calculate our variables, which were largely time-based off of that, including joint kinematics, reaction time, step duration, step length and weight asymmetry. Uh, so descriptive statistics were calculated first and then comparisons were made um, using one-way ANOVAs with the two key post hoc for our three conditions. So this is no AFO, AFO on the stance limb, and then AFO on the stepping limb. So these are the variables that I'll present for the presentation today. Um, we can see some significant differences um, on the AFO on the stepping foot and just a small explanation. So the asterisks indicate significance as compared to the stepping foot condition and the plus signs indicate significance compared to the no AFO condition. And then all positive joint angles are uh, reflected for flexion. Um, so we see a lower step length, a lower maximum joint angle at the ankle, a higher minimum joint angle at the ankle, as well as differences at the knee and the hip. So those are both lower joint angles at the peak as well. We can talk a little bit about um, what this means, starting with stepping foot preference. So we saw um, participants averaged about seven of the 10 trials without an AFO stepping with their right foot. This increased to eight of the 10 uh, when the AFO was placed on their left foot and dropped to a little bit over five uh, when the AFO was placed on their right foot. So the stepping foot preference is shifting as a result of the AFO. Participants also preferred a flat foot landing. Um, so this forced them into taking a shorter step length. It also influenced the knee joint angle um, and their step duration was constant throughout the trials. Um, so there was a lower average velocity when stepping with the AFO. And you can see some of these changes with the drawing on the left. Um, we also did see a kinematic chain of adjustments. So there were significant changes at the ankle, knee, and hip, with likely the hip and the knee being used to counter adjustments at the ankle due to restrictions from the AFO. So we can talk a little bit about AFO considerations. Um, so they are 100% needed for walking in specific patient groups. However, we do see an impact on reactive stepping, specifically influencing stepping foot preference as well as kinematic and temporal variables. So these adjustments could make fall recovery more difficult in already prone patient populations. So we would wanna extend future research to look at these patient populations while wearing an AFO. Um, and see if any of these variables are exacerbated in that patient population. And that is it. So I think we'll move into the question session now. Okay, thank you, Kara. Um, yeah, so we will move into the Q&A portion. We have um, about eight to, five to eight minutes here. Um, again, if you have questions, pose them into the chat window and the moderators will find those questions and redirect them to the speakers. So I think we have a few questions in the chat window that we'll start off with. Uh, so we have a question from Kurt Bishorner for Corbin. Uh, what is the evidence that the difference in external rotation for turn radius is based on active response versus, versus the passive dynamics of the slip? 
Yes, great question. Um, and I assume you're talking about the, the results for the slipping foot. Um, I guess my answer is uh, we don't know. <laughs> there's, there's nothing really from what I've presented that tells us whether it's the passive dynamics or an active response. Um, we were mainly looking just to see if there was something there that we could look into um, in future research. Um, so that's a great question we hope to answer eventually. Um, as, as for the recovery steps, if, if you're referring about to that, um, we compared that to the average unperturbed step, so the um, under the same context. So the fact that there is a change um, compared to those unperturbed steps leads me to believe that it would be uh, an active response. I hope that answered your question. All right. Um, Chewy Sui also had a question for Kira. What are his specific adjustments made at knee and hip while wearing the AFO? So it depends on whether or not the AFO is on the stepping or the stance limb, but when stepping with an AFO, we see lower maximum joint angles, so they're not um, flexing their knee or their hip as much um, by a few number of degrees um, in those recovery steps. Changes in the stance limb at the knee and the hip um, aren't as noticeable when comparing to the no AFO condition. Okay, and I have a question for uh, Sarah Hemmler, um, which was, how well does that model um, handle kind of asymmetrical wear, given that we had a talk on turning slip, um, there may be kind of medial to lateral wear, is that, handled in that model that you have um, and how does how might kind of asymmetrical wear from medial to lateral caused by pronation supination effect um, yeah that's a very that's a very good point um, and we do notice that um, maybe on the bottom of your shoes you see that you have some lateral wear more than medial um, and so this this model in particular it's to kind of get a basis for it if we largely have um, wear on the back of the heel, then can we use this model at all? And there are other factors that we can, um, we can add in later to accommodate for medial or lateral wear, but this is kind of like the base um, foundation for, is this model appropriate at all? And so we saw that for a lot of the shoes um, that there was primarily posterior wear on the heel. Um, and I guess for the unexpected slip trial, um, since it was the natural slip, so how they were wearing their shoes, um, that did accommodate for if they were more on the lateral side of the shoe where there was more wear, it was um, tracking that under shoe fluid pressure on that side anywhere. Anyway, good talk, a good question. Uh, the next question is for Kira from Jeremy Crenshaw. Did the presence of a, an AFO affect kinematics in the frontal plane? For example, did step width change? Uh, so this is all sagittal plane analysis, so I don't have any frontal plane um, variables, including step width. We did see length, step length and step height change, um, but not any step width since I haven't done that. Okay, we'll take one more question here and then we'll get started on the next talks so last question from Ganesh Bapat Kira great talk have you considered using rollover shape to evaluate dynamic balance in AFOs we have not uh, though I think that would be an interesting research study to look at going forward um, thanks for the questions okay thank you for all those questions we'll move over into the next block of four talks I'm going to hand over the moderator duties to Jamie Roper, who's going to be introducing our next speaker. Um, again, you can use the chat to post questions at any point in time, and we'll keep track of those to pose the speakers during the designated Q&A portion. All right. Hi, everyone. Our next speaker is Chui Tsui from Purdue University.
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Chui from, from Purdue Motor Behavior Group, and today I'm presenting the work on the sensitivity of the full clearance to joint angles of lower limbs during obstacle crossing. Tripping is a main contributor to falls and fall-related injuries. The risk of tripping is associ associated with toe clearance and toe clearance variability. The trip risk is highest at the minimum toe clearance and mid-swing during unobstructed walking and while the toe is directly above the obstacle for obstacle crossing. Older fallers and non-fallers have the same toe clearance, but the fallers have higher clearance variability. Furthermore, um, toe clearance variability as well as contact frequency is higher while crossing taller obstacles. However, the source of the toe clearance variability is not very well understood. Winter first described a source of toe clearance variability by modeling the lower limb right. as so an and, and quantifying the sensitivity of the toe clearance to errors in individual degrees of freedom. This approach was extended by others. However, the analysis have been limited to the sagittal plane angles, the swing limb, to unobstructed walking or obstacle crossing with the leaf crossing only. Therefore, our aim is to quantify the sensitivity of the toe clearance to bilateral lower limb joint angles during obstacle crossing when the lead and the trail foot cross the obstacle. In addition, we propose a novel measure of the toe clearance sensitivity to groups of joint angles. Specifically, we quantified the combined toe clearance sensitivity to four groups all swing and all stance limb joint angles, all frontal plane and all satchel plane joint angles. 10 young participants walk unobstructed or across three 10, 26 height obstacles. Each condition was performed 10 times in block randomized order. Two gate events, the lead crossing events and the trail crossing events were examined. First, we quantified the token sensitivity to the 10 individual joint angles. Here is the forward kinematic map We're that relates the, the joint window. angles to the toe clearance. The sensitivity to a particular yeah. joint angle, say the I, is the partial derivative of that forward kinematic map F with respect to I evaluated at the current posture. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Chui from Purdue Motor Behavior Group, and today I'm presenting the work on the sensitivity of the full clearance to joint angles of lower limbs during obstacle crossing. Tripping is a main contributor to falls and fall-related injuries. The risk of tripping is associ associated with toe clearance and toe clearance variability. The trip risk is highest at the minimum toe clearance and mid-swing during unobstructed walking, and while the toe is directly above the obstacle for obstacle crossing. Older fallers and non-fallers have the same toe clearance, but the fallers have higher clearance variability. Furthermore, um, toe clearance variability as well as contact frequency is higher while crossing taller obstacles. However, the source of the toe clearance variability is not very well understood. Winter first described a source of toe clearance variability by modeling the lower limb as a length segment chain and quantifying the sensitivity of the toe clearance to errors in individual degrees of freedom. This approach was extended by others. However, the analysis have been limited to the sagittal plane angles, the swing limb, to unobstructed walking or obstacle crossing with the leaf foot crossing only. Therefore, our aim is to quantify the sensitivity of the toe clearance to bilateral lower limb joint angles during obstacle crossing when the lead and the trail foot cross the obstacle. In addition, we propose a novel measure of the toe clearance sensitivity to groups of joint angles. Specifically, we quantified the combined toe clearance sensitivity to four groups, all swing and all stance limb joint angles, all frontal plane and all satchel plane joint angles. 
Ten young participants walked unobstructed or across three 1026 height obstacles. Each condition was performed ten times in block randomized order. Two gate events, the lead crossing events, and the trail crossing events were examined. First, we quantified the token sensitivity to the 10 individual joint angles. Here is the forward kinematic map that relates the 10 joint angles to the toe clearance. The sensitivity to a particular joint angle, theta i, is the partial derivative of that forward kinematic map f with respect to theta i evaluated at the current posture. The new measure combined sensitivity is obtained as the non-zero single value of the Jacobian comprising the partial derivatives of the same forward kinematic map with respect to a selective group of joint angles. For example, the, in the figure here, the theta 1, 2, 3 on the stance limb are considered moving, while the rest of the joint angles are considered fixed. Therefore, the combined sensitivity of the toe clearance to these three angles is the non-zero singular value of the Jacobian over here. Here is the individual sensitivity um, plot by the two gate events and the four different obstacle heights. The main take home message here is that the toe clearance is most sensitive to the stance hip ab abduction angle for unobstructed walking, and it is among the highest for the obstacle crossing as well. However, the individual sensitivities are difficult to interpret and are of limited therapeutic use. In contrast, there are clear patterns in the combined sensitivities. Here we plot the combined sensitivity for the stance and swing and by the two gate events. We see that the combined sensitivity to the stance limb is higher than the swing limb for both unobstructed and the obstructed walking. Similarly, in this figure, we see that the combined sensitivity to the sagittal plane angles was lower than the frontal plane angles for unobstructed gait. However, this relation was reversed for also crossing, where the sagittal plane angle group is higher. These results highlight the importance of the stance limb angles and the frontal plane angles during unobstructed and obstructed gait. Therapies should be tailored depending on where the trips occurs. Frontal plane muscle groups should not be ignored for tripping over ground. However, training limited to ab adductors may not be efficient in preventing trips over obstacles. The combined sensitivity analysis could be a tool to identify the therapeutic targets for interventions aimed at minimizing trip risk. Thank you guys for listening. Jamie, you're on, you were on mute. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> uh, Brian, if we can, I think we're seeing a lot of your mouse move around. So when you're hovering over different icons on your desktop, we're seeing those pop up instead of the screen. Uh, just a heads up for Noah's video. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be ready to share that if we have any issues. Got that. Thanks. I had a little bit of an issue on my end, so I was trying to resolve. No worries. So no worries. Apologize. Problem. Apologize to the speaker. Okay. Um, Noah is also ready to play his video. Noah, is that what you would prefer, or? Yep. Uh, Peter asked me to play from my screen. Okay. So I'll share. Right. So Noah Rosenblatt from Rosalind, Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science will be presenting next. Thanks everyone for your patience. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, um, share screen. Okay, now you are. We see yep. you. Looks yep. good. Hello, fellow ASP members. I'd like to welcome you to my home city in Evanston, Illinois, where I'd like to speak to you for the next five minutes about my work on obesity and falls and rattles. And I'd like to just acknowledge that Michael Madigan is also an author on this work. As everyone listening is well aware, falls by older adults represent a significant problem with not one in three older adults falling annually. What 
people may not be aware is that obesity in older adults increases the risk of falling by up to 50% depending on the level of obesity. And our work suggests that obesity may be particularly problematic in that it increases the risk of triple-related falls, which is what we wanted to understand further. So we looked at some of the literature and some early work suggests that obesity may actually be protective against falls that involve little or no initial angular velocity. However, if an initial angular velocity is present, obesity may actually impair recovery responses. And this would be the case, for example, when experiencing a trip during gait. So this basic concept informs our hypothesis, which is stated here in words, but also shown is schematically below. In essence, we hypothesize that there would be an interaction uh, between group obese normal weight groups in terms of how trunk kinematics of trunk angle and trunk angular velocity scale as a function of probation strength, which here we define in terms of acceleration of the trend. So how did we test this hypothesis? We recruited 29 normal weight older adults and 30 obese older adults. All uh, participants were screened in a state of otherwise healthy in that normal range of motion, no joint replacements, and all participants still report the ability to walk for a mile at any pace without having to stop. Participants completed functional tests and then returned to the laboratory for a second session where they completed the perturbation test. Perturbation testing involved uh, participants standing on a motorized treadmill that would suddenly accelerate underneath them. The treadmill would accelerate at a uh, one, anywhere between 1.5 and 3.5 meters per second squared. There were a total of 10 accelerations, which were each experienced three times for a total of 30 trials. During all the trials, participants were safety harness and we recorded their uh, motion or body motion to motion capture. And the motion capture data was then entered into mixed model analysis to test for the interaction effects. And in addition, the mixed model analysis allowed us to include a term, a random effect of subject, which was interesting to us because we wanted to be able to identify whether the extent to which kinematics scaled with acceleration was related to functional ability. So what did we find? Well, first of all, uh, sorry, looking back here, we focus on our hypothesis for each of the four variables. Group by acceleration was significantly uh, different uh, and as expected. When we look at the individual subject effects, which you can see on the figures at the right, we can better understand this. For example, on the right here, we see the trunk kinematics, the trunk angular velocity on the first step plotted as a function of the acceleration. Each curve in color represents the model fit for the particular subject. And you can see that the slopes for the obese are generally steeper than for the normal weight, and even though the obese tend to start at a lower intercept. And so what we did is for those three variables, um, see the last three variables where subject term was significant, when we correlated that with our functional measures, we saw uh, moderate correlations existing among many of the other variables, which we suggest indicates there are certain capabilities involved in recovering balance and controlling the trunk that are also necessary for these functional tasks, which is relevant in that it suggests that a battery of these functional tests could serve as a metric of an individual's response capabilities in the absence of being able to directly measure that. More importantly, we confirm that obesity provides protection against falls at low velocities but not high velocities, which provides impetus to utilize high velocity perturbations to train important recovery responses to prevent falls in obese older adults. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and wish you all a great day. Thank you, Noah. Next up, we have Carrie Lovero from the Combat Capabilities Devel Development Command Soldier Center.
sorry, I had to unmute myself there. And Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about how females have greater local dynamic stability than males when walking with military relevant loads. And I'd like to thank the conference organizers for including me in this session. And I'd like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Elliot Saltzman and Kara Lewis from, and Dr. Kara Lewis from Boston University, where this work was conducted. So as many of you may know or may not know, load carriage is an, is an essential military task, which previous research suggests that many of the kinematic adaptations made in response to load are in an attempt to maintain stability. But many of the stability measures used to quantify gait patterns, like the standard deviation of joint angles, shown here, measure kinematic variability, which considers strides to be independent, when in reality, we know that strides are interconnected. Instead, we can use nonlinear measures like the local divergence exponent shown here as the slope on a divergence curve to quantify local dynamic stability of gait. We can use a single continuous time series like the velocity time series of the C7 marker shown here. And for this measure, you reconstruct the kinematic time series into multiple dimensions shown here as a three-dimensional blob. And we can measure the rate at which the blob is expanding or contracting over time, where quickly expanding blobs are less stable than slowly expanding blobs. So in the past, we've shown or we've looked at how local dynamic stability is affected by military relevant loads and speeds when measured at the trunk and pelvis. And generally, we found that as load increased, participants became less stable, but were more stable when walking at faster speeds than at slower speeds. We've also found that females alter their sagittal and frontal plane hip mechanics differently than males in response to these loads. But no previous research has investigated if these are there are difference between local and local dynamic stability between females and males when wearing military relevant loads. So that was the purpose of this investigation. And we hypothesized that females would be less stable than males and that load would exacerbate these changes. So to do this, we had 15 females and 15 males walk on a treadmill for two minutes under a three loads at 1.35 meters per second. The load conditions were an unloaded condition with an empty weight vest a medium load with about 15 kilograms in the weight vest and a heavy load with about 26 kilograms in the weight vest. We then use Visual 3D to calculate the C7 and sacrum marker velocity time series in all three directions of motion, and then use MATLAB to reconstruct the velocity time series into that multi-dimensional blob, from which we calculated the local divergence exponent, which was then submitted to a two by three ANOVA for sex by load. So based on our analysis, we found that there were no interactions of sex by load, but we did find main effects of both sex and load, specifically for all directions of the trunk, but only in the vertical direction of the pelvis. For all significant effects of sex, we found that females were more stable than males across load. And in general, we found that as load increased, stability uh, decreased with load. So the big takeaway here is that females are more stable than males regardless of load and opposed to what we thought we would find. But load, as load increases, stability decreases. And the way that stability changes at the trunk and pelvis are different. Specifically, that trunk stability seems to be affected in all three directions of motions, while pelvis stability is only affected in the vertical direction. So where do we think these sex differences are coming from? Previously, we had reported that the differences in hip mechanics found between females and males wearing military relevance loads was likely due to the fact that females are generally shorter and lighter than their male counterparts. This increases the relative mass carried by the females, but also lowers where that mass is carried to the ground. So in the case of stability, this greater relative mass carried closer to the ground may have actually increased the female's local dynamic stability. So while load decreases stability across females and males, the rate of change in stability with load dif may differ between females and males. And that's what we are, are planning on looking at next with, these invest with our investigation. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources and the members of the Human Adaptation Lab at Boston University for their help on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Next up we have Chong Lu from the University of Southern California. Hi, 
Hi, uh, I'm Chang, and my presentation title is Does the reference axis for computing angle momentum affect inferences about dynamic balance? One of the challenges for human locomotion is to maintain balance when faced with external perturbations. To study how human control balance, one common measure is whole body angle momentum, which can characterize the whole body rotational behavior. Whole body angle momentum is computed as the sum of segment rotation about one reference axis and segment rotation about its own central mass. Thus, we have to choose a reference axis as this is a relative measure. Biomechanists primarily compute whole body angle momentum about the axes that are projecting through the central mass. However, there's no guarantee that this is the only choice. For example, uh, some robotics may use the axes that project through the um, center pressure or edge of support as we commonly picture the walking dynamics as an inverted pendulum. So for this study, we asked the question, uh, if the choice of the reference axes would influence our interpretations about how people regain balance and coordinate body segments following perturbations. We have four participants walk on the treadmill. We then suddenly uh, change the speed of the treadmill with different magnitude to simulate both uh, forward and backward slips. Uh, the perturbations are characterized as a trapezoid speed profile. The speed change occur around the foot strike and then uh, change back to their walking speed during the swing phase of their perturbed limb. We then calculate the angle momentum about two different reference axes the medial lateral axis projecting through the central mass and leading edge of support. We also use um, the sparse principle component analysis to extract the intersegmental coordination patterns. This analysis will inform us how the segmental angle momentum co-vary during the perturbation response and whether this co-variation depends on the reference axis we chose. We find that the angle momentum can capture the whole body response to treadmill perturbations with respect to either reference axes. So on the right, uh, left side here is the whole body angle momentum computed uh, relative to center mass. And on the right side is the edge of support. The black trajectories here indicate the um, angle momentum during normal walking. And we commonly define uh, back rotation as more positive and forward rotation as more negative. When perturbation occurred, in this case, uh, when the treadmill suddenly uh, accelerated, during the perturbation step, the participant would fall forward. Uh, thus, we will see that whole body angle momentum in both cases become more negative, which indicate forward rotation of the body. Then during the next recovery step, um, the participant will need to rotate backward to recover from the perturbation. In this case, the angle momentum become more positive. Um, so uh, for perturbation in the other direction, uh, in this case, is the treadmill suddenly decelerated and the participant will tend to fall backward. In this case, during the perturbation step, the whole body angle momentum in both cases become more positive. Here we plotted the maximum whole body angle momentum during the perturbation step and uh, with the perturbation speed change. So x axis here is the perturbation speed change um, and y axis is the maximum whole body angle momentum during the perturbation step. We find that regardless of the reference axis, uh, the maximum whole body angle momentum was negatively correlated with the change uh, in perturbation speed. And lastly, we extracted the segmental coordination patterns uh, during the perturbation step. Here, um, we also uh, referred these segmental coordination pattern as principal components. So here is example of the princ first principal component. On the x-axis are the segments, and y-axis are the weights for each segment. And this indicate how the momentum co-vary among segments. Um, so actually, we find that our interpretations about segmental coordination pattern may differ based on the reference axes. So here is the angle momentum calculated. Here is the angle momentum calculated reference to the central mass. Um, and we find that 
the lower limb actually dominates the extracted coordination pattern and segmental and momenta of the perturbed limb uh, were counteracted by the contralateral limb during the perturbation step. And for angle momentum calculated reference to the edge of support, uh, most of the variance explained by the inverted pendulum mechanics, uh, which encapsulate the trunk dynamics. So take home points, we find that the uh, whole body uh, we find that whole body angle momentum was negatively correlated with the change in speed during walking on the treadmill, regardless of the reference axes. And um, the center mass dynamics is the dominant factor in computing whole body angle momentum, um, while computing whole body momentum relative to center mass neglects this dynamics. Um, thanks for your time. I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Charles. All right, we're gonna open it up for questions now. All right, the first question is from Jacob Pinkolisker, and he, this question is for Chewy, uh, interesting talk. Can you compare your sensitivity analysis to an uncontrolled manifold approach that decomposes variability into different elements? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, we're interested in the UCM method as well, uh, but we believe there are two quite different approach where sensitivity analysis tells us uh, how much the toe head is sensitive to a certain joint angle or a group of joint angles. It's a result of uh, the posture that isolated, uh, so it's more mechanically doesn't explain uh, about how central nervous system control this variabilities in these certain joint angles. Uh, whereas UCM looks at all the variabilities from this uh, link chain and explain uh, more about the control problem or the coordination patterns. So I think down the line is, uh, it'd be interesting to take the UCM approach, but I have not compared uh, or how, I have not thought about how to link the results from sensitivity to a results of UCM method. Does that answer the question? I have a question here for Carrie. Um, this is from Courtney Budowicz. Hopefully I pronounced that last name correctly. I'm notorious for butchering, the, butchering those. Uh, so for Carrie, were there any changes in spatiotemporal parameters during gait in response to load? And how might these have influenced the local stability measures? Uh, so yes, uh, we don't, I didn't report it in this, but we have uh, looked at spatial temporal measures separately and we saw the very typical um, changes in spatial temporal measures that you see with load, which are uh, decreased stride length, increased stride width, um, those sorts of things, and like increased double support time, that sort of thing. Uh, what I haven't looked at is how those two, those measures correlate with the local dynamic stability measures that we've taken. We've actually looked at how spatial temporal measures at least the variability of spatial temporal measures compared to local dynamic stabilities in different populations. Um, and we've found that those actually don't always line up. Sometimes the things that you expect increase stability in terms of spatial temporal measures don't correlate well with uh, the local dynamic stability measures that we're looking at. The next question is for Noah from Sarah Hemler. Given the android versus gynoid fat distribution, uh, can you change the center of mass in the inferior superior direction? One, did you look at this relationship with your findings? And two, do you think this would alter your findings, especially at low velocities? Right, so I didn't present this data, but we did um, do DEXA body scan for percent fat in the trunk and uh, lower limbs. And we did take um, circumference of hip, waist, and thigh. We did run correlations between those anthropometric measures and those subject-specific slopes from the model. And I, we saw actually <clears throat> almost, when you just do individual correlations, essentially those, every anthropometric is correlated 
with those subject specific slopes with the strongest relationship for the trunk, which you would kind of expect. Um, so what we do need to actually look at a little bit more is um, maybe a regression approach to see if the trunk is, is truncal fat is an independent contributor after accounting for all the other variables. Um, but we certainly have the data and should look into that because you're correct that that should influence our results. All right, last question. Yeah, last question here is for Chong from Luis Nolasco. Do you think that whole body angular momentum about each referen reference axis answers the same question? Which should we be looking at for balance control and is it task dependent? That's a very good question. I actually think um, these two um, reference axes, if we calculate relative to center mass or base of support, they provide supplementary information. Uh, for example, if we just look at whole body angle momentum reference to center mass, it's easier probably for us to identify how much the limb, uh, limb ang angle momentum cancellation occurred during the perturbation response or walking. But if we uh, add more information, for example, if we calculate relative to the edge of support, we, um, they actually can provide the uh, center mass dynamics information. So I don't think they we should, it's like one or another uh, other question. It's more like um, depends on what's so your question and what's your hypothesis. Uh, you might think outside just using the reference uh, projecting through the center mass, which is all the one we always use kind of. All right, thank you for the good um, discussion, guys. Next, we'll head into our uh, last block of presentations. Again, if you have any questions, please add them to the chat box. So first, we have up Gabriella Small. All right, hi, everyone. I am Gabriella Small, a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm gonna to give a brief talk on my dual task study, the influence of cognitive load on dynamic balance during steady state walking. So in order to successfully perform activities and move around in your everyday life, you have to maintain control of your balance. However, there are situations where you face additional cognitive loads, whether that be listening to music or talking on the phone. And these additional attentional demands might impair your ability to control your balance. Additional cognitive tasks cause competition for available attention. And that can reduce the resources available for controlling gait, producing a decline in your dynamic balance. And that's especially important if you're considering populations with balance impairments who are already at a high risk for falls. The purpose of the study was to determine how healthy individuals prioritize their cognitive resources and control dynamic balance during steady state treadmill walking with increasingly difficult cognitive tasks. To achieve this, we had 15 healthy participants walk in a single task condition with no cognitive load and in three dual task conditions, which would pair a cognitive load with walking. These were listening to a podcast, spelling short five-letter words backwards, and spelling long 10-letter words backwards. So to assess balance control, we analyzed the frontal plane range of whole body angle momentum, as it's been validated in a number of gait studies and with multiple populations as uh, an assessment of balance control. Higher ranges of whole body angle momentum correlate to lower clinical balance scores and subsequently decreased balance control. So we had our participants complete the protocol at both a standard one meter per second speed and at their self-selected walking speed, which averaged a little higher at about 1.35 meters per second. And at both speeds, the listening trials and the no load trials had the same whole body angular momentum. So that means that just passive listening did not affect balance control. However, when spelling both the short and the long words, the range of whole body angular momentum increased when compared to the no load trials. So that suggests that balance control actually decreases with these higher cognitive loads. 
So we also wanted to know what happens to your cognitive performance when you start walking. So we had quite a range of spelling ability in our participants, but across all the conditions, they performed better in the short word task than in the long word task. In this figure, you can see the short word task, the purple bars, had a higher correct response rate than the long words, and they also had a lower percent error. So that means the long word task wasn't just twice as long, it actually was a more challenging mental task. However, there were no differences between the single task, spelling while standing, and the dual task, spelling while walking, and either the short or even in the more challenging long word tasks. So these results suggest that frontal plane balance requires active control and subsequently decreases with higher cognitive loads. So in order to see an influence of a cognitive load on balance control in healthy individuals, you need a sufficiently challenging mental task. Furthermore, cognitive performance did not change between the single and dual task conditions. And so that suggests that healthy subjects might be able to prioritize their cognitive performance over balance control, especially when performing an easy motor tasks, such as treadmill walking, and a more challenging cognitive task, such as spelling backwards. So in conclusion, these results provide additional insights into the automaticity of walking and task prioritization in young healthy adults. And that provides the basis for future studies to determine differences in aging and in neurologically impaired populations. Lastly, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Neptune, Lydia Brew, and everyone in the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab for their help with this project. And thank you all so much for listening. Great, thank you, Gabriella. Next we have up is Danielle Liss. Oh, Daniel, I think you're still muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Today I'm gonna to speak about how young adults can perceive very small disturbances to their walking balance, even when distracted. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the WV CTSI for their funding of this pilot project. Before a person can make corrective motor actions to not fall, they must first perceive that a disturbance has occurred. The subcortical contributions to this motor response have been extensively studied. Based on more recent brain imaging and recording studies, we are learning that a higher, learning that higher level cortical processes also play a significant role. These processes are still not well understood and may be important for groups that have poor subcortical responses to disturbances, such as older adults or stroke survivors. To probe the involvement of these higher level cortical processes, we're investigating conscious perception of locomotor disturbances. As a first step in determining age and disease related effects, we examined conscious perception in young adults. 12 subjects walked at a self-selected speed on a split belt treadmill and received a perturbation at heel strike every eight to 12 strides in which the belt speed slowed down. Seven perturbation speeds were repeated five times for each leg in a random order. After each perturbation, we asked subjects to respond yes or no if they perceived this perturbation. We then repeated the experimental protocol with subjects counting backwards from a random number by threes. To identify the perception threshold, we fit a psychrometric curve to the proportion of correct responses for each perturbation speed. The conscious perception threshold was defined as the 50% point of this fit. For example, this subject had a perception threshold of 0.096 meters per second. 
Across all subjects, the average threshold was 0 0.07 meters per second. Although there was a range of perception thresholds, this was not influenced by self-selected walking speed. So what might be contributing to these young adults consciously perceiving these small disturbances? We believe that proprioceptive feedback is likely the major contributor. This is because we found no significant differences in head movement at these low level perturbations, suggesting there were minimal contributions from visual or vestibular feedback. We also had two subjects repeat the experiment who were forced to pick which leg was perturbed. Both these subjects performed better at this task, meaning they had a lower threshold. This suggests that we may notice changes in this proprioceptive feedback. For example, due to changes in muscle length or velocity, even if we did not feel off balance. Based on this pilot work, we're investigating the role of proprioceptive feedback in conscious perception and changes with age-related proprioceptive decline. With the cognitive task, there is a mixed response of some subjects increasing, decreasing, and staying the same, which led to no significant difference. Young adults maintain their ability to perceive disturbances, likely because they have a lot of cognitive reserve and the dual task may not be challenging enough. It is likely that cognitive distractions may interfere more with older adults' ability to consciously perceive disturbances. We know that there's cognitive decline due to aging, so we expect older adults to perform worse at this perception task. Our next step is to investigate the effect of age-related cognitive decline on conscious perception of locomotor disturbances. Is conscious perception of a locomotor disturbance even important for walking balance control? We think so based on results from prior studies across various groups and tasks that have associated poor walking and balance to a worse ability to consciously perceive movements, such as perception of ankle motion in older adults and perception of walking asymmetry in stroke survivors. Conscious perception of locomotor disturbances could aid in explaining increased fall risk for populations that have poor subcortical responses to disturbances. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions and feedback at the questions period. Great, thanks, Daniel. Next up, we have Brian Selgrade. All right, thanks, Erica. Um, today, I'm going to talk with you about susceptibility to optical flow balance perturbations in older adults with a cognitive distraction task. So let's go ahead and get started. There we go. All right, um, so we know from previous work that optical flow uh, perturbations increase gait variability, uh, which is a, a commonly used measure for uh, assessing walking balance. And this increase is even greater in older adults. Um, we also know that cognitive tasks can interfere with walking performance. And uh, just in daily living, uh, walking often requires us to, to maintain our balance and have a good cognitive performance. For example, if you're walking down the sidewalk looking for a place to cross the road, uh, you need to be, use your cognition to assess um, oncoming traffic and speeds and whether you're going to get hit by a car or not, but you also still need to avoid falling. Um, however, the combined effects of optical flow perturbations and cognitive tasks on walking balance uh, are not currently known. So our purpose was to determine the effects of a cognitive task on older adults' gait variability in the presence of optical flow perturbations. We hypothesized uh, that gait variability in response to these perturbations uh, would decrease with the addition of a cognitive task. Our rationale for that hypothesis was that the cognitive task would limit the, uh, the person's focus on the perturbations and thus reduce the impact of the perturbations on gait variability. Uh, we, we do recognize an alternative possibility that um, maybe the cognitive tasks would disrupt the older adult's response to the perturbation, and then you would see the opposite result. You'd see an increase in, in gait variability. Um, all right, so to test this hypothesis, we first 
recruited uh, 10 older adults, average age of about 75, to participate in this study. And the study was done on this treadmill in front of a, a big screen here, uh, or behind a big screen, I should say, uh, onto which we projected this uh, two-dimensional, uh, this, this uh, virtual hallway that you see here in, in black and white. Uh, so that, that was their virtual environment they were walking in. So after they acclimated to the, tre to the treadmill, um, the participants completed uh, four walking conditions that we assessed over two minutes. Um, first was a control trial, which is walking with um, normal optical flow. Uh, so it just looked like a hallway was, was moving past them. Uh, they also did a, a perturbation trial, which uh, the medial lateral perturbations are what you see here, the hallway moving from side to side. Um, and additionally, uh, they did walking with, again, normal optical flow, but now uh, also doing a auditory Stroop task. That was our cognitive task that I'll, I'll cover more in the next slide. Um, finally, they did a condition where they had both these perturbations, which again, you see up here, uh, and the Stroop task at the same time. All right, so if you're not familiar with the auditory Stroop task, um, you might be familiar with the visual Stroop task where you read a word, but you're supposed to say not the word you read, but the color of it. So for example, for this one, you would say green, red, purple would be the correct answer. Auditory Stroop is, is very similar, uh, but you hear a word, we had the participants wearing headphones, and they would hear either the word high or low in a high or low pitch. So for example, if you're doing this test and you heard high, in a low pitch like that, you would say low would be the correct answer. Um, and the auditory Stroop task was what we chose because it doesn't rely on the visual pathways that you need for um, optical flow, uh, for you know, seeing the optical flow. Um, for analysis, we used uh, we primarily steplet variability and center of mass variability, which we just calculated as a standard deviation of those two, um, so step width and uh, medial lateral position of the center of mass, respectively. Um, and for statistical analysis, we use a one-way repeated measures ANOVA to compare those, those four conditions. If that had a significant main effect, uh, we use post hoc paired t-tests for individual condition to condition comparisons. What we found was that the perturbations affected gate variability, the Stroop task really had no effect. Um, so you can see this here with steplet variability, um, average, uh, step with variability over, over the two minutes with the control and Stroop was uh, relatively low and similar. Um, when uh, comparing those to the perturbation trial, the perturbation uh, caused a uh, step with variability that was twice as great. Uh, but the Stroop task, when we added that to perturbation, again, had no effect. And we see the exact same results with center of mass posi position variability. So uh, our hypothesis, we would have expected the Stroop task uh, to decrease uh, center uh, to decrease variability compared to this perturbation task. And, uh, but we saw no effect. So the hypothesis uh, be between those two trials. So the hypothesis was not supported, um, which uh, we can say from that, since these optical flow perturbations showed that a uh, large increase in gate variability, regardless of what the Stroop task was doing, um, we can say that's, that's a, there's a pretty robust effect. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention the uh, correct response rate was similar across trials um, for, for the Stroop task. So people did that pretty well. Uh, all right, so we're low on time, but I want to thank Jackson, Tina, and Moo for helping with data collection and the NIA for their funding. Um, and I'll take questions, I guess, after Chase's talk. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Brian. Next we have up is Chase Rock. All right, so um, yeah, my name is Chase Rock and I'm a PhD student in the Comparative Neuromechanics Lab at Georgia Tech. And I'll be pre presenting a project that I've been working on uh, with a sub-team inside the lab called the Graviteam, um, which consists of myself, Angela, Christy, Younghee, and also uh, another undergraduate student, Drew. 
And as you can guess from our name, we're interested in studying gravity and specifically how people adapt their movement and base neuromechanical predictions off of their sense of gravity. So to start, I'll give you an example of how someone uh, determines their behavior based off a gravity prediction. So here we have a lady who is suspended in a harness and uh, she's pretty accurately showing how comfortable it is to be uh, suspended in a harness like that. And what's gonna happen is she's gonna be dropped and uh, hit the ground. And in order to avoid you know, tripping after she contacts the ground, she has to activate her muscles. And what happens is that that muscle activation occurs about 100 milliseconds prior to hitting the ground, if you're looking at the soleus muscle. And so that in itself is a gravity prediction because you have to take into account the height you're dropping from, um, when you're gonna hit the ground, and when you need to pre-activate your muscles. But even stronger evidence is that when you adjust the height that you're dropping a person from, they tend to pre-activate their muscles still at that 100 millisecond time frame. So people can take into account the height they're gonna fall from and then determine when they need to pre-activate those muscles prior to hitting the ground. And this means that they have to use some sort of uh, gravity esti estimation to accurately time their muscles. So in our study, we're gonna see if we can kind of mess with their gravity estim estimation. Um, so our purpose is to characterize how people adapt to uh, landing in hypergravity, um, uh, specifically looking at that pre-activation that I just described. And our hypothesis is that after you train someone in a reduced gravity setting, um, that muscle activation onset will be delayed. So I'll take you through our experimental paradigm. It's a pretty typical adaptation paradigm. So we have a precondition um, where people are doing these targeted jumps, which I'll show you in a second. And they do 10 of those. They go into our low gravity simulation and do uh, about 50 jumps there. And then we have a post condition where they do 1G jumps again. And this should be a video of that setup. So this is what the jumps look like for every condition, except the exception here is that this is the hypogravity condition. So he's in a harness, which is attached to some constant force springs that are mounted above him, which uh, oppose the force of gravity by about half this person's body weight. So we're simulating about half G. And what you see on the screen there is uh, feedback. So we give them a vertical target that they have to reach that's customized for each participant. And they have to reach that target with the apex of their jump for each jump. And that target stays the same between all conditions. So what we're really interested in comparing is the muscle pre-activation timing in the pre-condition versus the post-condition. And I'll show you a, a little bit of a summary of our results. So, for the precondition is what I'm showing you here. We have pre-activation timing on the x-axis, and you can see that in the average precondition, our participants pre-activated their soleus muscle at about 70 seconds prior to hitting the ground. But then when we compare that to the post-condition, we see that that muscle pre-activation timing is delayed. And this is the results for the soleus, but of the eight muscles we studied in the lower limbs, we saw significant similar changes in five of the eight muscles. So that leads us to the conclusion that following hypogravity training, the muscle activation onset is delayed. And this is evidence of a updated gravity-based prediction that persists after returning to normal gravity. And so this is kind of specific to this task, but our uh, future work is going to determine if this gravity-based adaptation transfers to other tasks that would require a gravity-based prediction. So I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the Cognitive Neuromechanics Lab and in the Gravit team and Georgia Tech, NSF, and people who help out in the Power Lab. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Chase. Uh, we'll now open up the floor for questions. Okay, and so our first question here is for Gabriella, um, and there's there are quite a few, but we'll choose one. Um, this one is from uh, Scott Bobinger, 
for Gabriella, interesting stuff. Did you find that in individuals who were more challenged by the spelling task had larger impairments to balance between the single task and dual task conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. We didn't see any differences. There were some people had different techniques for how they would spell the words backwards. And we were hoping maybe there would be some kind of correlation between the technique you used and your balance control, but there, there wasn't in the end. So everybody performed pretty similar regardless of your spelling ability. Our next question is for Daniel from James Finley. Were your measures of head movement based on acceleration or displacement? Do you think the choice about how one measures head movement would influence interpretations about the sources of sensory information used to perceive perturbations? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for the measures of head movement, we actually did calculations for position, velocity, and uh, acceleration angularly. Um, but I definitely think from picking one, if picking one of those measures, that's definitely going to influence your interpretation um, about the sources of sensory information, which is why we ran the analysis on all three. Our next question is for Brian from Jordan Sturdy. Do you think that the visual perturbations were too strong to observe any additional effect from the Stroop task? That is, do you think the participants had enough cognitive reserve to attend to both perturbations with somewhat equal attention resources? Um, so uh, the short answer is yes. Um, there, so the perturbations were, you know, we set the perturbations, we can set them at different levels in a previous study from Jason, Jason Franz's uh, group. You see, you see they have significant, every level has a significant effect. This was the largest one. Um, and, and you know, clearly they were able to do the cognitive task correctly. Um, so, it, the, the, I mean, the data certainly suggests that they were able to deal with both the perturbation and uh, that cognitive task. Uh, we were a little limited. We wanted to ass assess the effect of the task on cognition and not like kind of having your vision split between looking at the perturbations and looking at, you know, a, a visual cognitive task. So um, that limited what we could choose. Uh, we might, uh, since older adults were able to do this, we, we might try to find a more difficult cognitive task in the future. Okay, we are right at the end of the session. Um, I'm gonna ask one more quick question to Chase, which is, um, is there any evidence that the gravity prediction could um, change based on greater orientation to the gravity vector, for instance, laying down for months on end being on bed rest and then going to upright. Um, so yeah, I think that's really interesting. And then there are people who uh, do study gravity manipulation in that way. And a good example of that is if you lay down and try to throw a ball up and catch it, it's like weirdly difficult. Um, so yes, I think there, the, the, there's an orientation aspect to the gravity adaptation. Um, but we tried to keep people nice and upright during the entire task. So hopefully that didn't affect our results too much. Okay, I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, thank you to the audience who was um, asking great questions and kind of dealing with some of the technical difficulties as we were one of the guinea pigs here for this uh, virtual session. Um, and thanks to all the hard work from the program committee to put this virtual session together. Um, we will take all the questions that are in the chat that were not answered and post those to Slack. We'll make sure to tag the uh, authors or the authors and presenters as well as the person who posed the question. Uh, and so we can continue this discussion. I see that Lena Ting said that the AMTI lounge is available for post sessions discussions um, as well. So you can carry on this discussion in there uh, for the future. So thank you to everyone and we'll see you in more uh, Zoom meeting rooms.